Up first, China and Russia. Four billion dollars in deals and a series of exchange years bring the two neighbors closer together. All this and more coming up on World Insight. Thanks for joining us on this program. If you're watching us here in China, you'll have just come out of the annual National Day holiday. But post-vacation, wherever you are, I'm James Chow with a new edition of World Insight as you look back at the past seven days and the main stories from there. Let's get started now with our lead report. Uh, here's how we begin. This week, Vladimir Putin came to Beijing on his first official visit here since becoming Russian Prime Minister in May last year. The trip also coincides with the 60th anniversary of the Sino-Russian relationship and also the Russian language year in China. Relations between Moscow and Beijing are now seen as being at their best, and Putin's visit is seen as a strong catalyst to help bolster a closer and more dynamic relationship. <laughs> Autumn in Beijing, and Vladimir Putin's trip has yielded quite a harvest. When the premiers of China and Russia held their 14th regular meeting on Tuesday, the two sides signed 12 agreements. One was a missile launch notification pact. In particular, I would like to point out the military agreement signed between our two countries in which the two parties undertake to notify each other of ballistic missile launch plans. The agreement is a very important step to enhance mutual trust and strengthen bilateral cooperation. Ballistic missile launch plans are a core national secret. Only very friendly countries would notify each other. This this kind of pact has been signed between other countries before, but always between allies, such as the U.S. and Japan, the U.S. and South Korea. But China and Russia are not allies, so establishing a notification system represents a stronger basis of mutual trust. The Soviet Union was the first country to establish diplomatic relations with China, a day after the founding of the People's Republic. The two sides enjoyed a honeymoon in the following decade. But in the late 1960s, ideological differences began to widen. It wasn't until the 1980s that relations began to pick up again. History reminds us China and Russia cannot ally with nor confront each other. In the 1950s, the two were allies but not equals. The alliance became a subordinate relationship. From the 1960s to the 1970s, it's estimated the Soviet Union spent 200 billion rubles on military confrontation with China every year. And China used half of its national revenue for military spending. Both countries missed the best 20 years of development. On the websites of major Russian media, the series of agreements signed this week filled the headlines. One focus was a preliminary agreement on Russian state-run gas giant Gazprom supplying China National Petroleum Corporation. The deal could open the way to the world's biggest natural gas producer supplying 70 billion cubic meters a year to China from Siberia and the Russian Far East. It's the biggest bilateral trade agreement ever signed. Another focus was an outline agreement on a high-speed train in Russia's Far East. The line from Vladivostok to Khabarovsk could use China's high-speed train technology, which comes close to that of some developed countries like Japan and France. Investment will be billions to tens of billions of U.S. dollars. Russia likes the value for money. 
The high-speed railway construction means the injection of Chinese money into Russian infrastructure. Amid financial crisis, many countries are busy saving themselves, but trade between China and Russia is totally open. Through the 1950s honeymoon period, tens of thousands of Soviet experts were sent to assist China's construction. With their help, China completed 156 major projects, laying down the foundation for its industry. Today, the roles have been redefined. The construction of the high-speed train will raise the status of Made in China and become another milestone in Sino-Russian friendship. Fruitful achievements have been seen in the fields of mutual political trust, strategic coordination, and practical cooperation. The two nations completely resolved this border issue left over from history. The signing of the Treaty of Good Neighborliness and Friendly Cooperation laid a solid legal foundation for bilateral relations. The two sides have formed more than 30 bilateral cooperation and exchange systems, and bilateral trade volume have increased sevenfold. For 10 years, China-Russian trade has grown at an annual average rate of almost 30 percent. Last year's trade volume was about $57 billion. China is now Russia's third largest trading partner, and Russia is China's 11th biggest. The global downturn has seen trade fall. But Putin is optimistic about the prospects. And deals worth over 4 billion U.S. dollars signed this week seem to justify his confidence. Of course, during the global financial crisis, trade volume will go through a slight decrease from the previous year. But what we observe is the quality of the structure itself unchanged. Another highlight of Putin's three-day visit was the Prime Minister's meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization on Wednesday. Established in 2001, the SCO quickly took on momentum and became an influential organization to improve economic cooperation in Central Asia and regional security. In 2005, under the framework of the SCO, the armies of China and Russia carried out their first joint military exercises. Since then, they've staged anti-terrorism exercises, peace mission, every other year. But Chinese observers point out that the core to consolidating the relationship is deepening understanding between peoples. The past 60 years showed that when we just emphasize political relationship, the bilateral ties are not reliable. Only people-to-people -people understanding can lay a more solid foundation for the sound development of bilateral ties. The two sides are building on their traditional friendship. In the new millennium, cultural exchanges have become one of the highlights. In 2006 and 2007, China and Russia staged national theme year activities in each other's country. 2009 has seen the year of Russian language in China, and next year China will return the favor. For the older generation, Hundreds of cultural events stirred some fond memories. Singing classic Russian songs turned their thoughts back to the 1950s. At that time, we wore the Lenin coat, three buttons, one belt. It looked so sharp and beautiful. And for many young Chinese, their enthusiasm has been sparked for learning Russian. And the human touch will continue to keep Sino-Russian relations going strong from generation to generation.
Now let's turn to this screen and take a look at this map because China and Russia share that border which stretches all the way by 4,300 kilometers. For these giant neighbors, their combined territory reaches over 20 million square kilometers and a combined population of more than 1.5 billion people. Neighbors can't be chosen, but the relationship can be decided. And past and present have shown both the Chinese and the Russians exactly how to decide. Coming up next, we'll talk about overcoming past enmity as a new journey starts for Turkey and Armenia.